Uh, this is fundamentals test seven. Um, once a minute, you know, fundamentals, we kind of go from one end to the other and try to cover all the territory. So you're going to hear some of these things in engine, engine repair as well. Uh, more should be saturated with some of these facts though. Uh, normal oil pump pressure in an engine is how many PSI? 10 to 60. 10 to 60 is a good answer. 10 is as low as it ought to ever go. Um, you said like that, I was waiting for you to say bud. Nope. Um, I was going to say the Dodge pickup one time, 78 Dodge pickup crew cab. It was not really all that old. That's some miles on it. We bought it new. That company I was working for down there in uh, Texas. And the oil pressure, you know, all that was flickering on. And I was trying to figure out what um, was going on with it. And I really wasn't able to track anything down. But I put a gauge on it that would just mounted one under the dash so they could watch the oil pressure pretty close. And it was hovering down around 10 PSI. And they were driving it to Port Arthur and it died and made large noises. And what had happened was the crankshaft broke on it and the crankshaft was cracked. And I say it was losing oil pressure because the crankshaft was cracked and it was squirting out of the crack when it came apart. In a typical engine lubrication system, what components were the last to receive oil? We did this the other day, what was it? Valve train components, you know the answer is all passages in an engine block are usually called what? Galleries. Coolant is antifreeze plus? Uh, water. Dex cool is what type of coolant? Ding, 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 ding. B and C. Oh. It's organic acid technology, which is oat, and then it's ethylene glycol. Uh, if coolant is mixed with 50-50 with water, what is the freezing point? Uh, well, the, what is the freezing point of water? So it was not going to be A, is it? Let me ask you this. What if I put a, a Bunsen burner or a burner up under a skillet and I had my temperature gun and I started that water, just put some tap water in a skillet and I started it boiling, how hot could I get that water? That's as high as it'll go. It starts evaporating. They don't, how would I, if I, there's two ways you can increase the Pressure. boiling point. One, that's one way. What's the other way? Magic. Pour some antifreeze in it. It would raise the boiling point. Got it? Um, so basically, uh, if you're at higher altitudes, water boils at a lower temperature too, so remember that. So six is? Everybody knows D, 30, uh, minus 34 to minus 37. Why is minus 34 Fahrenheit and minus 37 Celsius so close? It's not. Why are they so close to each other? <laughs> huh? It's not. Well, because 40 is where they cross. 40 is 40 Fahrenheit is the same as 40 Celsius, right? So you're getting close to that, so they get closer together as they go, right? Um, if the thermostat is not working, what diagnostic trouble code could be set? The PO440. One twenty eight. I knew that. PO128 is means that the engine operating temperature is not being reached. Now PO128 typically means the thermostat is opening early. A PO125 usually means the thermostat is, is stuck wide open or has come apart. Now, both those codes are clearly related. Uh, the additives used in coolant, such as dye and any corrosion additives, are about what percentage of the coolant? That's a good question, isn't it? 3%. 3%, very small amount. Uh, what type of water is used in premixed coolant? Distilled. Yes, and if you're smart, if you're mixing coolant up to pour in your own vehicle, you all you will have bought a jug or two of distilled water from Publix or somewhere because it only costs about seventy nine cents. You mix that. This one guy came up there one day from they lived in Dothan and he came to the Ford place and he went back there to talk to to me and he says I had some antifreeze that I mixed with water uh, three or four years ago and I put it in the shelf of my garage to, so I would have some antifreeze mixed with water on hand. And he says and whenever I screwed the top off of it and poured in something, it was just all mushy, goopy stuff like it had algae growing in it or something. And uh, I said, did you use tap water? And he said, yeah. And I said, that's why. 
should have used distilled water and it would still be pretty and clean, you know. Uh, but I don't know what was in his tap water, but it was because he used tap water and set it on the shelf for three or four years that it did that. And I'm not saying it'll do that every time, but it did with him. If he used it till water, he wouldn't have had a problem. Uh, using 100% coolant in the cooling system improves the cooling capacity of the system. True or false? That's false. Uh, Ford messed up several years ago and put all just straight antifreeze in some of their pickup truck engines. And um, they were cracking cylinder heads, destroying things. And they had to. And they found out it was because somebody mixed up, messed up the mix in the factory. And they put a bunch of trucks out there with straight antifreeze in them. Um, when inspecting engine oil, what should be checked? Proper level. Feels slippery and not gritty. Obviously, who wants gritty engine oil, right? Color, all of the above. Most vehicle manufacturers. Specify brake fluid that meets what specification? Three. Dot three. What's dot five? Two more than three. No, it's uh -huh, that's pretty funny. It's got uh, silicone in it, and that's okay if you're going to use it on something that doesn't have anti-lock brakes, and it makes the rubber components last longer. But if you're using anti-lock, if you got anti-lock brakes, you put silicone brake fluid in there, it makes foam, and you can lose your pedal. I tell you what messed me up one time. I was driving this 95 Taurus and I never used the parking brake on hardly any vehicle unless it's got a handbrake, so I'm not going to pull it out. But I'm not going to, if I've got a car that I'm putting in park and it's not going to roll away, I'm not going to lock the park brake. I'm just not going to do it. I'm not saying that you shouldn't, I'm just saying I'm not going to. And uh, I need to have an air compressor, air compressor put on it and my guys here at the school uh, put them on there. And one of the guys was a real fastidious kind of a guy and um, he got in that car when he went to park it, and he locked the park brake down real good when he parked it, because that's the way he always did that. Well, it just so happened, and I didn't know this, that my park brake light was out, the light that tells you the park brake's engaged, the red brake light. And I drove that thing all the way to Enterprise with the park brake on. And when I pulled up there at, the, at Tartan Pines over there to stop, and the pedal was, I just barely was able to stop. And then I realized that the park brake was down. I said, the, the fluid's boiling in this thing. And when the fluid boils, it makes air. And when it makes air, the pedal goes down. And so the next day, we had to rebuild the brakes. <laughs> on the back of it, it didn't cost that much, like $16. But a lot of the times, if you're driving with a park brake on, you'll have to put springs and everything on it because it'll ruin them. You know? but, uh, but see, I wasn't accustomed to that. Anytime somebody uh, you know, does something you're not accustomed to, let me ask you this. When somebody has an accident, of course nowadays sometimes it's because people are texting, but when everybody's paying attention but an accident happens, what's typically the reason for that? Somebody did something that the other people didn't expect. Everybody in traffic needs to know what everybody else is doing, right? That's why you have turn signals and stoplights and all that. And uh, when I took my driver's test, uh, you know what was required on a car when I took my driver's test? One stoplight, two headlights. You didn't even have to have turn signals. You could do this for a left turn. You know. I mean, for a right turn. Yeah, they didn't. Well, yeah, they started requiring seat belts in the 60s uh, and all that. But uh, anyway, um, let me flip this over. The cabin filter can be accessed from where? What do you think? Under the hood, under the dash. It ain't going to be under the vehicle, is it? My cabin filter in my Taurus has never been checked since I got in the car. I guess I probably should check it. Um, uh, coolant can be, and besides that, let me tell you this, every vehicle is not going to have a cabin air filter. I'll tell you something else. If you, and you may run into this, if you work somewhere, um, we had a cabin air filter we were going to change in uh, about a 2010 Nissan Altima. And when the cabin air filter got here, it was a little filter about this big. But when we found, I mean, where you take it out, it's right over the, the tunnel in the middle, you know, right in the front middle, and you pull this cover off, and you grab that thing, there's a little hole about this big for it to come out of it. When you pull that out of there, uh, it accordions down to a smaller size, and when it springs out, it's like this big. And I think they wanted you to put two of these little ones in there or something. 
That must have been what it was. Uh, but when Nissan puts a great big filter in a little bitty hole, you know, you stick it through there and then it goes boing, 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 it springs out and it filters everything. And that is confusing as all get out if you don't know it's coming. I remember that's a late model Altima, like, well, I say 2010, 2007, 2000, whatever, you know. I don't know if they've changed that in the most recent year models, but that was really interesting to me that they did that. Um, General Motors vans, like the uh, Montana and the uh, Venture van, you open the glove box, you reach up and there's a little cover out, and you pull a filter out, and then you slide another filter over and pull it out. And those filters are uh, going to be, uh, believe it or not, they're more expensive at the parts house than they are at the dealer. And words of the wise, this is a fundamental thing, if you're going to buy parts, check with the dealer and the parts house, and you'd be surprised how many times the dealer is less expensive than the parts house on some parts. I've seen that before. And it, it, the first time I saw it, the dealer wanted $2 or something for an oil pressure sending unit, and the parts house wanted 8 bucks for it. And it was in 1983 I ran into that for the first time. And I was just stunned because everybody's always taught you the dealer is higher. And uh, I had to have a, a uh, uh, petitioner for that one car I was driving. It just popped when I was backing out of the driveway, and all of a sudden I've got no power here or anything. And so it was on a weekend, so I go around here to the local uh, chain parts store on Rucker Boulevard, and I said, I want a, a tensioner for this car of mine. It was like $80. I said, that sounds pretty high. And I had to have it, though, so I bought it. And uh, I went to the, park, the Ford place when I opened up uh, the, the following week, and I said, how much would I pay for this if I just walked in off the street? And they said, 51 bucks. I paid eighty dollars at the parts house for a part that would cost me fifty-one bucks at the dealer, and the one I bought from the parts house, the pulley got crooked on it and it started throwing the belt within a few thousand miles. Be particular about that kind of thing. Some things you're better off, you know, uh, buying a brand name. Like Gates makes a pretty good tensioner and stuff. You know, some of those other ones aren't that good. Uh, coolant can be checked using what? Dexron six and Mercon five are examples of what? Automatic transmission fluid. You've poured that stuff in, haven't you? Um, Jimmy, uh, the guy that I got working at Ford Place up there. Well, Adam, when Adam was working over uh, in Ozark, he changed out a transmission on a Windstar. He got put a rebuilt one in there, and it came with fluid in it and everything. And he put it in there and, you know, got it all fixed up and headed out the door. And they came back and it was acting strange. And so uh, he called me up. He said, what should I do about this? Because we bought this from Ford Place. And I said, send it up there, let Jimmy fix it under warranty because it's a Ford transmission. And so uh, I sent it up there and I said, and when he got up there, I said, Jimmy, what'd you find wrong with that transmission? Adam said, I was there. He said, it had the wrong fluid in it. And I said, well, how did you find that? He goes, I could smell it. <laughs> and you, you can, it's got friction modifier in it. You know, and you can smell it you can, if you're, I didn't even think about that, but he said, as soon as he smelled it, he knew it had the wrong fluid in it and it was making it surge. You know, the torque converter uh, was causing that. Um, let's see, um, Technician A says most manufacturers specify replacement of the air filter every 30,000 miles. Technician B recommends replacing the air filter every year. What do you think? Both of them. Uh, depending, I would be looking at it usually when you do an oil change, it's a good idea to look at it. And, uh, but here's something else about an air filter. When you're putting an air filter back in there, you're working with a piece of plastic, right? Okay, that piece of plastic has got to be settled down in there and it's got to be pinched down around the corner of that air filter so no dirt gets sucked in there. Well, the same folks on Power Stroke Diesel pickup trucks that would be fighting with the air filter that really didn't know what they were doing putting it back on there and they would break the dadgum air filter housing somehow and have a crack in it or whatever because they didn't put it back on there right. And they didn't want to pay 150 bucks for another air box. So what they would do is they'd put some duct tape on it or something. And the duct tape would come loose, and then it would start pulling dirt in there. And next thing you know, they would need a twelve, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 engine because of a cracked air filter housing. When you pull the air filter off and there's a whole bunch of dust and dirt inside the hose leading into the engine, and the engine has no compression, what is that telling you? And how long has this been this way? It's a whole lot better off. And make sure when you're putting that air filter housing back on there that you put it back on there right that you got it snapped down. It, look, it may look like a piece of plastic, like it's not that important, but it's keeping that dirt out of there. And if it's not back on there the right way, you know, any, I mean, so air can't get in there with it's carrying dirt with it, it it'll make a mess. 
um, particularly if they're driving in a dusty environment. It's not quite so bad on the highway. Um, technician A says metal brake fluid. The metal brake fluid reservoir found on older vehicles requires the top to be removed to check fluid level. Well, yeah, you can't see through that cast iron, can you? Uh, B says when filling a brake fluid reservoir to leave room for expansion due to heat. Uh, both those guys are right. Um, sometimes when somebody cranks up their vehicle, listen to this, uh, Miss Holloway, cranks up their vehicle, I say, I got a red brake light. And then when I get about a mile down the road, it goes off. And this happens every morning. You'd be surprised how many times you'll see that. That's because it's a little bit low on brake fluid because the pads have worn, those calipers have filled, the level in the brake, master cylinder goes down. All you gotta do is add a little brake fluid and you fix their problem. You'll probably hear somebody asking you about that day after tomorrow. Right? Of course, since you're in school, they're all going to want you to fix their car all the time, right? <laughs> all right. Uh, polyglycol brake fluid is what? Polyglycol brake fluid is petroleum -based. amber. Petroleum based. Good. Yeah, that's amber in color. If you put anything petroleum based in a master cylinder, the rubber will all get fat and the brakes will quit working. Do you like having fat rubber and non-working brakes? All the time. Oh man, it's a mess. Um, hybrid electric vehicle may have more than one cooling system. It'll have yeah. a cooling system for the Batteries. inverter, yeah, and the battery. You know. Now, if you look under the hood, the battery's in the back. But what they're talking about is in the front. You'll have two different fluid cooling systems. But on like a, a the older Ford Escapes and stuff. They had a secondary evaporator back there and an air intake that would cool the battery independently of the inside of the car. Uh, because on the hybrid battery, the, the cooler, you know, it needs to stay cool. Now, what is this tool used for? Somebody has used one of these just a couple, I mean, last week, didn't you? What is that? This is the kind of question you'd see on an ASE test. It's a refractometer. A refractometer. And is it check tire pressure? Yeah. Coolant level, coolant freeze protection, protection. brake fluid moisture level. It will check battery water specific gravity as well as coolant of all kinds. You guys like that? Sure. sure. Okay. It's going to check the freeze protection. That's going to be C. Moving on to eight. All right. Many vehicles do not require chassis lubrication if they are equipped with what? Low friction suspension joints such as ball joints, seal for life joints, no grease fittings, or all of the above. That's all of the above. Um, I will tell you that um, a lot of vehicles come, like that Dodge that we put that tie rod in with day. the original equipment stuff comes with no grease fitting, you know, but they have grease in them uh, and then a lot of times they go dry. How many people are turned up? When you turn the wheel on some of them, they're squeaking. It squeaks because the ball joints are dry. Coolant leak will show us what color. Uh, it could be orange, green, or red. It can also be purple. I mean, um, the red coolant is going to be in some of your foreign cars, like the Asian vehicles and stuff. They love red coolant. It's pure old red coolant. Um, why do they make all these fluids so many different colors anyway? spot leaks. We'll be able to see what's leaking. If ever fluid was the same color, it would be a mess, wouldn't it? Which oil specification stands for the thickness viscosity? Thickness viscosity. Is it API, LSAC, SAE, or ACEA? Wow, that's a tough question, isn't it? That's the SAE, Society of American Engineers. And now, uh, which oil standard is displayed on the front of the oil container? EPI. Ilsac. Oh. Yep. Uh, technician, uh, service technician removed the inspection fill plug from the differential of a rear wheel drive vehicle and gear lube started to flow out. Technician A says the technician should quickly replace the plug to prevent any more loss of gear lube. Technician B says to catch the fluid and allow the fluid to continue to drain. Who's right about that? Me. Yeah, because it's got too much in it. Uh, it's not supposed to be up that high. As a matter of fact, in that white Chevrolet truck out there, and uh, you might notice it's even got a little thing that says that the fluid level in that 
differential is supposed to be 40 millimeters below the hole. Isn't that interesting? It would be that far below the hole. They don't want it to be any fuller than that. I mean, I don't really trust that, but that's what that, ta that tag on the side of it says. It's that. less than an inch, or it's less than two inches. Hmm? It's less than two inches. Yeah, 40 inches is more than an inch, though. It was like a... It's like an inch and a half. Yeah, about an inch and a half. Wow. That's right, because it'd be 40, 25 plus 15. It wouldn't be exactly an inch and a half. It would be 12 and a half. It'd be like an inch and five inches. Yes. Uh, a grease fitting can be called a what? Zerk fitting, alamite fitting, grease fitting, any of the above. D was the right answer on that one. He did what I do sometimes when I'm taking a test. I'll machine gun it. The first right answer, I'll put that one down, and then it's an all of the above, you know. Uh, the red fluid discovered under a vehicle could be due to a leaking what? B or C. Yeah, that's B or C, uh, depending if it's got red antifreeze in it. You need to find out about that. But some people, and listen to this, and for eons at a filling station I worked at, we put uh, automatic transmission fluid and power steering, you know, because it, it worked. Um, later on, I found out that that can cause leaks on some vehicles. Uh, Volkswagen Jetta is in the shop for an oil change. Oh, joy. What specification is used for this European vehicle? ACEA. ACEA, that is the B. What is a typical lube used in rear axle drive assemblies? Rear drive axle assemblies, I'm sorry. ACEA. I got. Uh, differences of opinion here. Any of the above, depending on the specification for the vehicle. One time I rebuilt the, uh, there's this guy that donated his uh, two, 72 Toyota Corolla to the company I was working for, and he was a, uh, one of the salesmen or something. And we just took it in as a company car, and it had some transmission issues, and so I pulled the transmission out of it. And that little manual transmission, I think it was cool as all get out, because it had a bunch of 12 millimeter uh, had bolts, you know, they were 8 millimeter bolts, but they had 12 millimeter Zing, 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 took him off and the thing opened up like a suitcase. You could see all the gear so pretty in there. And uh, so I had to, I went there to replace whatever was worn out, I don't remember what it was. But I didn't have any oil to put in it except for gear oil, like 140, you know. And so I pumped some of that in there because, you know, 140 is better than no oil. And uh, it would clash, it had gear clash in every gear because that oil was too thick. And so I had to get that oil out of there and put, you know, the, the right oil in there. But remember that if somebody's got gear clashed, make sure that the oil's not too thick in their manual transmission. An under vehicle inspection includes checking for, incidentally, let me say this too, some transmissions nowadays, manual transmissions, take 50 weight gear oil. Some of them take automatic transmission fluid, believe it or not. Um, an under vehicle inspection uh, includes checking for A, torn out drive axle shaft boots, B, any fluid leaks, C, exhaust system faults such as broken hangers or leaks, and that would be what? You guys all have done that before. It's all of the above. Let's check for all of those. And we find broken hangers a lot because these hangers we buy from the parts house are last about as long as Lee press on nails. Um, oil viscosity refers to which of these? The color of the oil, whether the oil is gas for gas or diesel, tendency of the oil to resist flowing has nothing to do with the size of the oil container. Different brands of oil can be used in a vehicle from one oil change to another if they meet vehicle specifications because all oil is blank. Missable. Missable. If I was going to make that word up, I would say mixable. Uh, but they said M-I-S-C-I-B-L-E. Uh, I guarantee you that most of the uh, English teachers will not know that word. And you could probably put that in an English composition paper somehow and have them wondering. They've got to scurry for their dictionary to go look it up or pull out their smartphone and say, define missable. All right. Which rating is the ACA rating specified for by, use by, excuse me, which rating is the ACA rating specified for use by many European vehicle manufacturers? A3 slash B3. A3 or B3. The W in SAE 5W20 means? Winter. Winter, winter, winter. It's not weight. Everybody thinks it means weight. 
Go to the parts store. They'll argue with you about that. Most of them will. Which of these oils is recommended by General Motors for diesel engines beginning in 2011? Hmm? Dexos 1. Dexos 2. Yeah, you were a little bit behind there. 15, 14 winter. Huh? Winter. 14 is winter, yeah. And I was going to... Here's another little short story. There was a Ford Ranchero that this girl drove that went to pick up our stuff from Port Arthur and back when I was working for that company down in Texas. And it had lots and lots and lots of miles on it. Nobody knew how many miles that car had on it, but she, it, it was in the wind. And we didn't have time to even pull the thing out of service. To, we just had to keep it checked, and it was using a quart of oil every two days. And so I said, we got to do put an engine in this thing or put rings in it or something because it's in terrible shape. So I was talking to the guy at the parts store, David Hughes, at Spence Battery, and he said, why don't you buy a case of Exxon Uniflow and put that in there and see what that does? Because we were using mobile oil. And I said, really? Exxon Uniflow? He says, yeah. He said, I've heard some people say that that reduces oil consumption. I said, yeah, well, I don't know about that. You know, I don't know oil that will keep it from burning as much oil. So I got a case of oil, Exxon Uniflow, and we changed the oil and we put a new filter on and put that in there, and it went from a quart every two days to a quart every two weeks. Made that much difference just putting a different kind of oil in it. So, huh? Too. You could tell she was really interested in that story. All right. Uh, what is the purpose of the oil bypass filter, oil filter bypass valve? Excuse me. That allows oil to bypass the filter. If the filter becomes clogged, you know that's going to be a necessity. Uh, a dirty oil is better than no oil. A major advantage of using synthetic 16. oil. Huh? 16. Did I jump over 15? No, I said 15 with Dexos 2. 16. Oh. Which of the following should be used when changing the oil in a car with a gasoline engine made in 2004 or 2005? API SM. Everybody like that answer? API SM sounds good. What's SM stand for? What's S stand for in SM? Something. Spark fired engine. If it's a C, it's a compression fired, which would be a diesel. Got that? Um, all right, so the major advantage of using synthetic oil is its ability to do what? It reduces engine life. That's a major advantage. <laughs> it remains fluid at very low temperatures. How much force is generally used to check out our arms? 25 pounds. You know, what's an idler arm? It's on the, you know, the parallelogram steering where you got a pitman arm and then you got an idler arm that carries the other side? No. That's what that is. How much end play is generally acceptable in tie rod ends? None. Uh, okay, here's a, uh, here's a short story. I was in Savannah at Keller's Flea Market, and these people had this special kind of oil additive they were selling. There's a stapler in here somewhere if you don't staple those together. And um, this oil additive uh, that they poured in this engine, a little four-cylinder Iron Duke Chevrolet engine. And they... Huh? Some stuff in the red bottle. Uh, it was some kind of Teflon stuff, I guess. Well, anyway, they fired that thing up, and they took the valve cover and the side cover and the oil pan off, drained all the oil out of it, and it sat there and idled all day long without no oil pan, no top cover, no nothing. And they were, they were proving just how good that Teflon stuff was. So what would you think about that? Would you want some of that stuff if you saw the engine sitting there running all day long with no oil pan on it? Just running it had a cooling system radiator all on it. That's a good story with it.